Welcome to Entrepreneurs International Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the Community Manager. Today, Michael Davis is going to help you to start telling high-impact stories. Michael, I have got four questions that are going to help us get to know you. Number one, do you have a secret that you'd be willing to share with us? Yes, I do. Uh, I always wanted to be a rock star and never became one because I can't sing and I don't have the discipline to learn an instrument. <laughs> but in my mind, I would have been great. <laughs> All right. Question number two, what is your superpower? Now that we know it's not singing. Listening. That's what's helped me most as a coach and, and a consultant is to really ask the right questions and dig deep to find the, the true story, the gold that you'll hear about in a few minutes. All right. Question number three, what is your favorite way of relaxing? I love driving fast or being on a beach. I really can't pick between the two. If I could drive fast on a beach, stop the car and get out and sit and get in the waves, maybe that would be the ideal place. And question number four, what's the biggest challenge you've ever had to overcome? My own self-limiting beliefs that I wasn't good enough to do what I do because I had no great accomplishments, no designations, and no accomplishments like many of my mentors and coaches did. Okay, that's pretty powerful. Okay, a few messages for participants. Uh, Michael is going to get his energy from you. And if you are off camera, there's precious little energy for him to extract. So help him help you, if at all possible, come and stay on camera. Second request, please stay muted and type any questions that you've got into the chat. At about every 10 minutes, I'll pose your questions to Michael just rest assured that by the end of Michael's workshop, you will have all your questions answered. Now, this workshop is being recorded, and you'll be sent a link uh, to the recording tomorrow. So you really don't have to take notes unless you find that taking notes really helps you understand uh, uh, and, and remember uh, what Michael's, Michael has to say. Uh, Michael, are you ready to knock our socks off? I am. Then I am going to come off camera and the show is all yours. All right. Wow us. What's your deal? No, really, what's your deal? No, that's not what I was thinking about 20 minutes ago when we had two Zoom bombers on the call. That was what a woman named Leslie said to me many years ago, back in 2008, when I was a financial advisor. Part of my job was to give financial retirement workshops in the community. And on this particular night, I'm standing in front of 49 successful business women. And not five minutes into my talk, Leslie raises her hand and says, hey, Michael, what's your deal? What do you mean, what's my deal? I'm here giving a retirement presentation. She said, you know, we have somebody come into this group every single month. And you know what? You guys all sound the same. You got your prepackaged presentation. You got your slides. And you all are ending up trying to sell us something. What's your deal? You ever had a moment when your brain locked up and you had no idea what to say? Well, that's what happened to me was it turns out that was the most important night in my career because of that confrontation, I went on to discover the power of storytelling. Now you'll hear more about that story in a few minutes, but for right now, know that, and I call that my what's your deal story. You may be wondering, am I in the right place? Well, if you're in sales, if you're a speaker, if you are an entrepreneur or a business owner, 
and you've ever struggled to beat out competitors, attract new clients, quickly earn the trust of prospective clients or new employees, or inspire your team, you're in the right place. I love this quote from Tony Robbins. The past does not equal the future. If you have tried storytelling, because it's a very popular topic right now, you've tried it and you've not gotten the success you think you should, doesn't mean you can't. It just means you haven't learned the right tools. Because as Tony Robbins also says, success leaves clues. My first eight years of speaking, I struggled until I got a mentor who led me to other mentors, coaches, and, and trainers who taught me the success principles of storytelling. And you're about to leave here tonight with some useful ideas because my objective when I do a workshop like this is to compress time. This has literally been a 28 year journey. I know my story was from 2008, but I started speaking in 1994 and I was a terrified speaker. I don't want you to take 28 years or 14 years or five years to learn this skill. And that's what you're going to walk away tonight, some foundational elements to help you do that. So our game plan for tonight is to help you uncover and realize the gold that you have in your stories. Number two, to show you how to create an experience for your listeners. Number three, uncover or discover your reasons why to tell stories. As a bonus insight, understand the value of a process and the next steps to help you make it happen. Now, if you stay all the way to the end, which if you, if you, you made it through the Zoom bomber tonight, I got no worries about you staying to the end. If you do, you'll get a copy of a valuable checklist and a copy of this slide deck and one other bonus. I'll show you how to get access to those in a little bit. But let's start with a question. And this is a little bit of audience participation. Just pop in the chat box. Why do we tell stories? Don't write long paragraphs, just a few words or one, one sentence. Why do we tell stories in business? What do you think the benefit is? And by the way, there's no wrong answer to this question. To relay a message, to connect emotionally, Uh, to connect with people, communication in, in a relatable way. All very good answer. All very good answers. So let's take a further look at this. Healing. I like that, Sean. I've not heard that answer before, but depending on the kind of work you do, yes, absolutely. Stories can help in a healing sense. All right. Again, no wrong answers to that question. Here's one of the most important reasons that we tell stories. If you think about it, you, me, all of the people that we would love to do business with have access to information via their laptop, their desktop, or their desktop and their laptop, their TVs, and their mobile phones. Information is not a problem. In fact, each of us suffers from information overload. One of the biggest problems I see with most presentations and stories is they're filled with information, which leaves a lot of people feeling like this. <laughs> you ever had so much coming at you, it's like you just want to run screaming from the room? Well, anytime you have a problem, you can go to YouTube or Google, and 99% of the time, you'll get information that will help you solve it. If that was the only way to solve problems, though, why do po most people still walk around having problems? That's not the solution. More ideas and information. So what we want to do is avoid information overload. The way you do that is a well-thought-out, well-structured, emotional, and sensory-rich story. Now, let's go a little deeper. You may be familiar with this, but storytelling is a very popular topic today. But it's, it's not one of those topics, I think it's a hot topic that's going to go away because we've been telling stories since our earliest ancestors. They used storytelling long before they had the ability to write and read to pass on our history, our culture, our morals, our ethics. And consequently, our brains have evolved to react to storytelling, stories that are sensory rich and emotional. 
when you hear a well-structured story, it, it triggers the release of cortisol, oxytocin, dopamine, and endorphins into your body. Now, the objective here is not to make you brain scientists, but what I would encourage you to do when you're giving presentations in the future and you find that you can tell when somebody's drifting, when they're not paying attention, go into a story because that'll trigger those chemicals. And all these are chemicals that get people involved, pay attention, create more trust and bonding with you. As a result of that, if you learn how to use stories in this way, it's going to help you become a more confident presenter. It will help you be more persuasive, engaging, and it will earn you trust faster. I have not found since I learned these keys to storytelling 14 years ago, I've not found a better way to quickly earn trust with people. You and I each have a communication toolkit. And when it comes to selling, for example, there is a competitor out there who can beat you either on price or delivery time or follow-up service. Right? Nobody can do all of these the best. Somebody's out there who can, who can beat you there. Or if you are hiring people, there may be competitors who can offer better benefits, maybe more opportunities for quicker career growth or better schedule that that's important to an employee. Or if you have a company and you're looking for investors, there may be a company that, uh, an alternate company also looking for investors that's a little more unique, has a better business plan, or maybe a potential be uh, bigger percentage of the market. So in our communication tool belt, we can only do so much. We can't control what our competitors have because they might be able to beat us here. The one area, the one communication tool you have that no one can match is your stories, your experiences with clients, satisfied clients, your origin story of why you got into business in the first place, or if you're working with a, a company that you didn't start, that company's story. That's your unique selling tool in the marketplace. Now, whether we're in sales, whether we are uh, attract, trying to attract new employees, Michael, you're frozen. They may not ask you these questions, but they are wondering the answers to these questions. Number one, who are you? What are you about? Number two, do you get me? Do you understand my problem? Number three, are you an expert in your field? Number four, can you solve my specific problem? More specifically, do you have a plan to solve my specific problem? Can I trust you? And do I like you? Again, the fastest way to answer this is not more information. It is a well-structured story that ties in with emotion and senses to make them feel some type of emotion toward you. Now, I just mentioned three types of stories. There are many types of business stories you can construct. We have found these three to be the most impactful type. Number one is the origin story. This is why you do what you do. And you probably guessed this by now, but the answer to the question, the best answer to the question, why do you do what you do is not because it pays well. That's not going to go over well with most folks. You, What people want to know is, when times are tough and they're struggling, will you be there for them? And a strong origin story, which ties into why you do what you do, will help them understand that. I don't have time to do it tonight, but a quick story about why I do what I do. All started when I was in first grade. I was six years old. I was humiliated in front of my first grade classmates. So much so that when I... Uh, got through that experience, I told myself, don't ever, ever stand in front of people again. That was awful. And for 25 years, I did not stand in front of people unless I was forced to through work, which led to me being in the financial uh, planning field, giving retirement planning workshops. But I understand the pain of embarrassment, humiliation, and regret from missed opportunities. 
It is a driving force on why I do what I do. I don't want other people to do that because I think, and I'm careful with this word, and the word is tragedy. I, I think it's overused, but in a business sense, not a human sense, but business, I don't think there's a bigger tragedy than someone who has a fantastic idea that could change the world, that could make people's lives better, and it never sees the light of day because they can't communicate it effectively. That's my origin story, my driving force. What I would challenge you to do, and you're going to see a framework later that you can use, structure your origin story so people know that you're there for the long run. It's not just some job I picked up along the way. The second type of story is the successful client story. Now, this is the one I typically have people tell in business, because when you can tell the story of a client who was struggling before that individual met you, you provided a solution, whether a product or service. They maybe took them a little while to implement, but once they did, they, they're now living a more successful life. The person hearing that story has that thought, I want that same result too. That's what the successful client story can do. And again, if you work for a company, a good founder story on why your company does what they do can also be very helpful and attract new clients and help you separate from the market in, in the marketplace. My first tip to you is to start to create a story file. And this does not have to be a long uh, two or three paragraph story every time. Any interaction that you have with a client who you've helped Jot down that person's name and just do this on your phone. Create a quick a document on your phone, on your laptop, on your iPad, and just put um, Mary Jones success story, um, whatever it specifically was. I've got a, one of my favorite stories is about a woman named Patty, who you'll see in a few minutes. Patty was terrified to speak when I met her. By the end, she was thrilled to death. So I just have to put Patty's story. I've got my what's your deal story. But start to capture those and it, make it a habit at the end of the day. What happened today that could be a useful story in my business? Now, I know in a lot of these workshops and, and, and webinars that the presenters are taught to get on screen and spend time telling you about their dogs and their family and all their life and all that. And I do not like to do that because I learned something a long time ago. You really don't care about all that, at least until you know that I understand your problem and have a solution for you. So if you want to know all that personal information, fine, we'll set up a one-to-one. -one. But I am going to take you through my personal journey to get to this point because in that journey, I made a lot of mistakes. And I want to point those mistakes out to you so that you can avoid them and again, compress time. So this really started for me yeah, I had the first great incident, but the, my journey towards speaking started in 1994 when I was a young financial advisor and I was told to go out and give presentations in the community. Well, one day my boss called me into his office. He sat me down. He slid some papers across the desk and he said, you know what? On second thought, don't even bother reading those, Michael. These are evaluations from your last workshop and um, your speaking skills, whoo, they suck. You know, when we hired you, you said you could get new clients through the door. You're not doing it. Your presentations are terrible. Your stories are boring. Either fix this or else. He was a real touchy-feely kind of guy, as you can tell. But I got the message. And it scared me. So for the first time in, in a long time, I had a decision to make. Either solve this problem about being afraid of speaking or lose your job. I chose to keep my job. So I found this organization called Toastmasters. Most of you are familiar with Toastmasters. That set me in a whole new direction because I learned some important ideas about speaking in Toastmasters. Number one, everybody's had a bad experience. Number two, being afraid of speaking is natural to human beings. And number three, speaking and storytelling is a learnable skill. Who knew? I thought you were born with the skill or you weren't, and you just kind of went along. If you weren't very good at it, you suffered through it anytime you did. So this was an eye-opening experience for me. Now, my parents, I love them. I still have them, thank goodness. Uh, 
one thing I don't like about the way they raised me is they taught me to, uh, if you want it done right, do it yourself, right? They are strong, independent business owners who did it themselves and they worked themselves, not to death, but they worked themselves to exhaustion. And I tried for eight years in Toastmasters to do it myself. And that wasn't very smart in retrospect because it wasn't until 2002, I decided I'm not getting very far teaching myself. And by the way, there's a speaker named Mike Rayburn, a hall of fame speaker. He says, the problem with being self-taught the teacher isn't very good. It's very hard to teach yourself something you haven't experienced. So I finally got that message after eight years. And it was literally 20 years and about two weeks ago that I met a young man who was the reigning world champion of public speaking, Darren LaCroix. You may know Darren if you're in Toastmasters. Well, that was a huge day for me because he took me under his wing. And 20 years later, I am part of his organization. We are good friends to this day. But Darren opened so many doors for me that I never could have opened myself. But most importantly, he started to teach me what speaking and storytelling is all about. So I went worked with him for a few years, which takes me all the way up to 2008. That night when the woman said, what's your deal? So... To take you back to that moment, here I stand in front of this group of women. These are This is a lot of potential good clients, but I am not there just to sell them. But I don't know how to, to, to enunciate that to them because she caught me so off guard with the way she asked that question that I was frozen. And all of a sudden, I had this thought in my head, <clears throat> tell them about your mom. Might as well. They don't like me. I haven't even gotten started and they think I'm here just to sell them something. So I proceeded to tell them a story from 20 years earlier about my mom. My mom was trying to start a business and she couldn't get any kind of money to start it. She couldn't get a business loan, couldn't get a credit card, uh, house loan, nothing. Because, and the women on this call will appreciate this and understand it, in the late 1980s, many women did not have a financial identity. My parents had just divorced and everything had been in my dad's name. That's kind of the way it was in the, in the 1980s. Even though my mom had handled the books for their business, she had handled the money. Everything was in his name. So she had no financial identity. She couldn't get money. And at one point in this process, she looked at me and she said, you know, this, this whole process makes me feel like I don't even exist. And I never will forget the pain in her voice and her face that day. Now, fortunately, eventually she did get a, a client of hers. She was a seamstress, really good seamstress. And she got a client who believed in her, gave her some seed money, and she went on to have a very successful business. But I told the women in this meeting that story. And when I was done, and I thought, I might as well pack it up. I'm done. They hate me. And then all of a sudden, Leslie from the back of the room, the one who had challenged me, you know, what's your deal? Michael, that's a great story. Carry on. And the room exploded in laughter. And we had one of the best seminars I've ever had. And to this day, 14 years later, I can't tell you what I said that night because I went totally off script. So what happened was two days later, I get called into my boss's office. Fortunately, this boss, a little bit nicer guy. So here's my timeline, takes me up to 2008. And because of this experience, and I'll tell you about the boss in a minute, I picked up my number one insight. And this is the first takeaway for you is that your stories are your gold, but you can't see it. And the reason you can't see it is because you lived it. All the experiences you've had, I don't I care how traumatic and how difficult they are, you lived it. So it's very easy to put it in this little compartment. Oh, that was just something I went through. And here I am today. And the reason I know that you discount your stories is because every week with my personal clients or with the group that I work with called Stage Time University, it never fails. And, I, and I'm, I'm using that word carefully, never. 
I, I hesitate to use extreme words like that, but in this case, it never fails when I work with somebody that at some point in the conversation of the coaching, I say to them, where was that in the story? Because it's so powerful. And they say, well, I didn't think it was that big a deal. It's very likely that you've had this thought. I haven't done anything remarkable or memorable. Who'd want to hear my stories? I haven't won an Olympic gold medal. I haven't climbed Mount Everest. I haven't flown into the uh, into space. And that's precisely why people want to hear your stories, because the vast majority of human beings, 99.99999% have never won an Olympic gold medal, climbed Mount Everest, or flown to space. But what most people have experienced is frustration and anger and conflict. And your stories that are rooted in those emotions are the ones that are going to connect with people. They are the emotional hook. The reality is the experiences you've had are gold. You just discount them because you lived it. And when I say you, I'm also pointing the finger at myself, at Roger, everyone. We've all done it. Michael, are you open to a question? Or I sure am. Okay. This is coming from Shauna. Sean is asking about showcasing success stories when you have so many. I think Shauna is asking, how do you prioritize what showcase story, what client success story to tell when you've got so many? Test, test, test a lot. And here's what I mean by that is you'll see the framework in a little bit. Shauna, take three or four of these stories, run each client story through this and test it out and see which ones get the best response. I'm still, 28 years later, a member of Toastmasters. Toastmasters is the best laboratory on the planet to go test material. There's no cost to you but your time. And you can get feedback. And uh, an uh, a tip I give to all my Toastmaster friends is you can be very specific about what feedback you get. You don't have to stick to the manual. You might just want to say to people, okay, what was it about this particular story about this client that stuck out to you? Why did it resonate or why didn't it resonate? So test it out. Uh, Michael, am I correct in, say, in spelling Darren Lacroix, D-A-R-R-E-N-L-A-C-R-O-I-X? You are correct. Okay. It is Darren Lacroix. So Shauna, I'm going to answer your next question. Does Toastmasters have a guest pass? I, I recollect that you're from Vancouver. There is one Toastmaster Club made for us entrepreneurs. It's called Vancouver Entrepreneurs Toastmasters Club. I founded it in 2007. Uh, it meets in Gastown tomorrow night, every Wednesday night. Uh, the first three meetings are free. Uh, the, the, everyone there is an entrepreneur. They talk entrepreneur stuff. Afterwards, they socialize. So it's a great way to professionally network as well as develop your public speaking skills. Vancouver Entrepreneurs Toastmasters Club. Back to you, Michael. Absolutely. Yes, definitely check that out. So you do, that's your goal. You definitely want to dig for your stories. And this is why Toastmasters, working with a coach, a trainer, a consultant is so important. They'll see the gold in it that you can't. It's human nature. All right. Here's a success story. This is the boss I had. I was working with this group, Orange Financial, in 2008. I, I represented them when I was doing the workshop that evening. Well, two days after that event, when I was just happy to get through it, my boss, best boss I've ever had, by the way, calls me in and says, what did you do the other night? And I thought, oh, God, I'm in trouble. We worked so hard on the slides and the presentation. So I started to tell him the story I told you about this event. And he stopped me. He said, no, 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 I'm not mad at you. I need you to understand something, Michael. We've been struggling with our webinars to get people to sign up for one-to-one -one meetings afterwards. You know, historically, we've been around 23%. I don't know what you did the other night, but so far, we've had 57% of the room sign up for meetings, and we haven't gotten through everybody yet. What did you do? So we talked for quite a while, and I said, I think it was this story. Now, Here's an example of somebody could see what I couldn't. I was just happy to survive the event. He said, there's something about this storytelling. We need to dig into this. This was back in 2008. 
back then there wasn't as much information that was flowing so freely about storytelling. So we did about six months of research. Some of it we had to do at the library of all places. And we did find some fundamental ideas that we started to incorporate. And over the next three years, I became, I, I was put in charge of doing these workshops and seminars. And what we went from was 23% to a 71% sign up rate after our workshops and seminars. And we didn't get all those people to do business with us. But as you know, if you're in sales, it's all about activity. We tripled activity, which helped our business grow. That was my first lesson that I got was this story that I just threw out out of desperation was my goal and I couldn't see it. So that was a specific client success story where I helped them. Now, because of that experience, I started to think I really, I really like this storytelling and speaking. And I decided to start my company on a part-time basis, speaking CPR. I was still a financial planner, but I knew in my gut that speaking and coaching others to be better speakers and storytellers was really what I wanted to do. So for the next few years, I, I worked uh, as a part-time coach. And this is where I picked up my second insight about storytelling. And when I got certified from my coach, Craig Valentine, who was also a past world champion, he taught me how to make each story an experience. And what I mean by that, and, and the best example I can give you of what most stories, uh, the way most stories are structured and why they don't work, it follows this format from an old fairy tale. A beautiful princess once upon a time met a handsome and dashing prince. They had a long courtship. They fell in love. They got married. And they live happily ever after. Now, here's a question for you. Is that a story? Put a Y for yes or an N for no in the chat box. Is that a story? Nope, nope, nope. I think the no's have it. The polls are about to close. We have a landslide victory. No, that is not a story. You are correct. And here's why. It does have some of the elements that you'll see in our framework. But the biggest reason this is not a story is because it follows a format that we call the AAA format. This stands for and, 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 meaning this happened and that happened. And this person did this and this per that person did this. And it's a series of ands. What that is, is called a report, which is why most business most business meetings end up like this or most speeches end up with audiences doing this yawning or looking at their phones what's missing here is conflict we can change the fairy tale by adding just one sentence to it beautiful princess meets a handsome dashing prince they have a long courtship they fall in love they get married they live happily ever after but then came the abduction. With that one sentence, what just happened in your brain? I just created a vacuum. Now you have questions. What? Who got, who, who got abducted? Why was that person abducted? Was that person saved? Who did the abducting? All these questions go through your mind. And that's called engagement. It starts the emotional connection with the listener. So as you go through your presentations and specifically your stories, ask yourself this question and get feedback from others. Does this feel like a series of and statements? That's what we call reporter mode. This happened, that happened, and that happened. That's what we want to avoid because the purpose of story is to elicit emotion and create engagement. The way we do that is insert conflict. And the most important word, by the way, in storytelling, is the word but. Now I know I get pushback on this because some people say, well, Michael, I've been told that you should never say but in everyday conversation. And you're perfect. And I agree with you 100%. If I said to Roger, Roger, I really like that shirt, but <laughs> he knows something negative is about to come. And I it just discounted everything I said, All right? That's everyday conversation. However, which is an alternative form of the word, but by the way, you don't have to use the word, but it can be, but yet, however, in storytelling that introduces the conflict. 
So look for your story. Is there a but, a yet, or a however that takes the story in a new direction that instantly engages the audience? That's what we're looking for. That's going to create the emotion. Here's another important idea that I got stuck on for years. Big mistake that I made. There is a saying in the professional speaking world, there was for years, that you should get your audience laugh in one minute and cry in the next. And I thought... And this is true. I'm not the kind of speaker that makes people cry. Therefore, I'm never going to be a successful speaker. And that thought process held me back for years because I thought, well, the professionals are saying that. That's old style thinking. That's not what it means to be emotional, where you have to be those two extremes, laughing hysterically and crying, because that may not fit your style. Here's what it means to, to be emotional in stories. There are six common emotions that all human beings share. There's happiness, anger, sadness, surprise, disgust, and fear. And just as a reminder, you're going to have access to all these slides. Feel free to take screenshots if you want as we go through, but you don't have to take all these notes as Roger told you earlier. But these are the six common emotions. Good stories will tie at least two or three of these in and sometimes all six but you need at least one to hook the audience with. This leads to my second success story of, of, of a client. This is Scott Mann. Scott is a retired Green Beret. When he left the Green Beret, he wanted to have an impact on veterans who were coming back and suffering many uh, emotional and, and mental distresses. Uh, so he, he learned how to become a speaker. He got pretty good at it. He got a TED talk out in Santa Barbara, California. I met him when I started working with him on his TED Talk in Cincinnati, Ohio. We had to take an 18-minute talk and turn it to seven minutes. And one of the things I worked with him on, he was really good at giving the surface ideas, but I worked with him to go deeper into his internal thoughts. He had some pretty heavy experiences, both in combat and back home after combat. And once he was willing to open up he became a much more successful presenter. He actually did a third TEDx talk. His talks have been seen over a million times. He also leveraged this ability to open up to be interviewed on CNN and Fox News. And he's, he actually wrote a play, which has been featured on, on, on uh, CBS. He Most importantly, though, from a business standpoint, he used all these skills to start a company called Rooftop Leadership. And Rooftop Leadership works with the business community to help them become better, more effective presenters and storytellers. He brings me in as a consultant from time to time. But when Scott was willing to open up and create experiences is when he started to have a much broader impact. Now, you may not want to be a playwright, be on TV, but take his example and, and model it to use experiences in your stories to create more interest in what you have to offer. Um, I don't know what happened to my slide here. Let me just skip by that one. Hold on. All right, now here's the third piece. Once I got to um, 2015 to 2017, I started doing work with TEDx and also with Scott Mann's group, Rooftop Leadership, I discovered a third mistake that I had been making over the years. And that was, I wasn't always tying my stories around a central purpose. Another old thought or mantra from the speaking world was make a point, tell a story, or tell a story, make a point, tell another story, make another point, tell another story, make another point. That doesn't work as well today because people need to know why. Why am I listening to these stories? If you've ever read the great book, one of the best books of the 20th century in business from Stephen Covey, his second of the seven habits of highly effective people was begin with the end in mind. So whenever you think about a story, say, what is the end result here? What's the finish line I want for my listener? What do I want them to think, feel, or do differently? And I mentioned earlier, uh, this reminds me of an old, old uh, saying in sales, a confused mind says no, a clear mind says go. Now, earlier tonight, we had a couple of folks come on and they were not clear on what their message is. And this is not uncommon. It's really hard to be crystal clear and get laser focused on what it is you want people to do if you're not sure about what it is you're offering it. Get clear on that and the whole world will open up.
this is where you need help because you're too close to your own messaging also, not just your own stories. So get clear on that. But this is a person I mentioned earlier, Patty. Patty was the, the president of a local foundation. She was one of my first clients. And when I met her, she was terrified of speaking. And her biggest goal whenever she spoke was, I just want to get through this. You know, I'm not sleeping well at night. My stomach's in knots. I regret saying yes to giving this speech. And one of the biggest reasons we found was that she did not have clarity when she was speaking about what she wanted people to do. She was the president of a foundation and her job was to raise money. It's hard to ask people to donate to what they can't, they don't understand. So we got her crystal clear on her stories, but we also set an end result goal for her. And that was to raise $30,000 for her next speech. It was really a shot in the dark. We just weren't sure because she had no consistency from her previous speeches when she was in front of donors. Well, she worked very hard for about eight weeks. She got tight on her stories and her messaging. And the night she gave her talk, when it was over, she actually uh, got $62,400 in donations, double what we expected. Again, we had no idea. We just shot for that number and got a lot more. That's not all, though. The best part of her story is we're sitting down a year later over lunch, and I said, well, have you been doing any speaking? She said, are you kidding me? I've been speaking all over the place because I was put in charge of raising money for a local boys and girls club. I was put in charge of our team of speakers. Michael, we've raised over a million dollars for the boys and girls club. I cannot believe what we've been able to do. Now, I love the end result financial because she was able to help over 500 families because of this activity. But my favorite part of Patty's story is this. She said, speaking is so much fun. Thank you so much for all the work we've done. I can't wait to do this again. <laughs> the best stories are about transformation. And that's why I mentioned to Shauna earlier is show the internal shift in the person you helped and the person listening to your story is going to say, that's what I want. That's what I've been missing. That's where I need help. So even though this story with Patty started with a specific numeric goal, it created this transformation because she got focused. She knew what her end result was. Michael, are you ready for a question? I am. Uh, this is also coming from Shauna, and it might be beyond the scope of your workshop. Okay. Shauna asks, I got to find where Shauna asks. Ah, so what is a quick way to get engagement that will get the media interested? In other words, it's a, it's a, it's a um, media relations type question. Headlines. You've got to create a headline that is compelling, it's provocative, and it makes people stop and say, what's this about? Let me give you a perfect example. I'm writing my second book right now. The, the, the working title has been, the title of this uh, workshop, Stop Telling Just Any Story, Start Telling Stories People Want to Hear. I've been running it by my friends, and they said, not, it, it, it's not provocative. So one of my friends suggested this title, and I'm leaning heavily toward this. Your stories suck. How to tell stories that people want to hear. Now, it's provocative, but it's not meant to just catch people and have shock value. There's a double meaning for the word. Suck as in not a very good story. Also, as in it sucks the life out of your audience and your presentation. It's provocative. Some people are going to be turned off by it, but it's going to get attention. So Shauna, you're in a, a field that is different. And I would uh, test some provocative titles that are going to snap people, to get them to stop and say, oh, I need, to, I need to hear more. So try to study some headlines if you can. Work with people that do a lot of uh, focus in the headline area. Hope that helps. Yeah. Perfect. No further questions, Michael. All right. As we're heading. Uh, and just, to... a little, just a little time check. We've got about 15 minutes to go. Gotcha. Yeah. We're heading down the home stretch here. All right. The, so uh, this whole journey has taken me up to 2022 where we are. And in the last couple of years, 
I have righted a big missing piece out of, of my coaching and speaking. That was creating a framework for people to build stories quickly. You would never, ever build a house by sticking up some walls and a roof and hoping the thing stands up. <laughs> you would build a solid foundation, some floors, walls, more floors, more walls, so that it was as sturdy as possible and it could withstand the strongest storms. This is my high impact story framework that I've developed over time. Now, at first glance, this framework looks a lot like this. <laughs> if you ever took chemistry class and said, oh my God, not the table of elements. Some people want to run screaming from the room. Don't, because this framework boils down to these, this line at the top, these seven elements. And we don't have time to go in depth, but you'll understand why these are important because the way this chart is set up is to show you if a piece is missing what's the impact so for example if you your story doesn't have a purpose people are, are going to forget it very quickly they might be entertained but it's like it's not memorable if you don't have a main character who's going through this journey that's relatable to the audience they're going to think who cares if the circumstances of the story are not relatable, specifically the internal circumstances, the fear, the negative emotions, it may be entertaining, but it will not inspire them to take action. Conflict, you heard about this before. That's where the emotion has started. If you don't have conflict, there's no emotional hook. They're not gonna buy into the message and they won't remember it. Now, as important as those setup features are, eventually your listener does need to hear success. Because without success, they're going to be frustrated. They're going to think, why did you take me through that just to leave me hanging? And it would be like, uh, yeah, I'm showing my age. I mean, I'm an original Star Wars fan. It'd be like if Luke hopped into the X-Wing and, and flew off toward the Death Star and he just ended the movie right there. It's like, well, what happened? <laughs> did he blow it up or not? Or if Frodo got right to the edge and he had the ring and then Peter Jackson, the director, just, nah, I think I'll end it there. Got to give them the ending. The other feature that most people do not put into their stories, which is critically important, is the new life. In the story you just saw about Patty, her new life wasn't, uh, the, the story didn't stop when she got the 62,400 donations. It was the year later when she went out and she and her team raised a million dollars and she had a new attitude about speaking. That's the new life. If you don't show that the change is permanent, the audience can have doubt. They can say, well, you told a story of a one-time success with your product, but then they went back to the old ways, right? Nope. Show the new life to let them know the change is permanent. And then the last part is delivery. Delivery is critical once you have your story in place, because if you just come across as somebody who's overacting or monotone, they're going to get bored. It needs to be an authentic delivery spoken in your language, the way you speak in everyday conversational tone so that people buy into the framework. The benefits of having a framework, you can use this in a 60 second talk, a five minute story. If you're using a series of stories throughout an all day presentation, that's one of the big benefits, but you're gonna get clarity on what you your message is about and what you want them to do. People are going to trust you because they're relating to your characters. You're going to feel a connection with them. You'll feel more confident because you're getting positive feedback from your listeners. You're going to make more sales and you're going to gain more referrals because stories are easily shared with others when they're emotional and content rich. All right, as we begin to wrap up, you were promised that we would show you how to uncover your gold, create an experience, discover your reason why to tell stories, and also see a proven process, a framework, if you will. And if you could, and you don't have to answer this in the chat box, just think to yourself, if you could find your gold, create an experience, be clear on your reason why to tell your story, and use a framework do you believe you could be a more successful communicator? Now, are you encouraged by what you've just seen? And if so, are you also feeling a little stuffed? <laughs> I call this the lunch buffet syndrome. 
You remember pre-COVID, at least here in the States, we had these lunch buffets you could go to. And if you're like a lot of people, you'd go to these lunch buffets and you would stand in line, you'd fill up your plate, and then you'd go sit down, you'd start eating. And if you're like me, about halfway through that plate, you'd think, $12.99 is a lot of money to pay for one plate of food. I'm going back for more. So I went back, I'd got a second plate. And then I might go and get a third plate. And by the end, I was feeling like this stuffed guy right here. Right? That's what often we do to our audiences when we put too much information in. And I know in a webinar like this, sometimes you have a tendency to feel that way. I try to put enough in so you feel like you got value, but not so much that you feel like this guy. So what I find is people attend these for one of two reasons. Number one, they want free information, advice, or help. And that is great. I hope you're walking away with some useful ideas. Speaking of which, here are the bonuses I promise. And Roger, if you could put the first link in for the bonus in the chat box, there'll also be a QR code in a moment. But here are the th the resources. Right, Michael, uh, remember we had to stop that. I lost the chat. No, I resent it to you. You didn't get it? Oh, well, it's in my email and I... No, that's okay. I'll, I'll put it back in in just a moment. There's a QR code, but I'll pop it back in when I'm done here. Thank you. Um, high impact storytelling checklist. Just when you're putting your story together, this is a checklist you can go through to make sure you've got all the key elements. Second is, whoops, uh, slide deck. You'll have all these slides. You'll have those in a PDF format that you can go through with uh, this. And there's a third bonus that I didn't mention earlier. It's called 52 Storytelling Insights. If, if you really like this topic, sign up for these, no cost, no obligation. It's my list. Nobody else gets it, but you get a weekly five minute audio sent right to your email inbox. And the idea behind this is to build one skill on top of another over a year's time. When I went through this myself, I tripled my storytelling skills over a year because it enabled me to test and work new ideas into my storytelling. Now, if you want to download those, I'll keep this up for a second. I'll put the, the uh, address in the chat box in just a moment if you want to link to it. Uh, the, first two, uh, the, the first two resources, you don't have to give me any of your personal information. If you want the insights, we just need your email address to send that to you there. All right. The second reason people attend is sometimes they want the information, but they also want to test drive and see what would it be like to work with me. Now I have an entire menu of resources and for me to come on here and say, well, let me, maybe you should invest in this one or this one or this one. I don't know. I don't like that idea because it's like going to the doctor and not doing any diagnosis and saying, here, take this pill. So if you'd like to get deeper information, maybe you think it, it's something you'd like to consider working with me. Here's the benefit, first of all, of working with a coach it may not be me. You may decide it doesn't work, but you want to coach, you get more confidence. You get more predictability because you've got processes you can put in place. You'll get clarity of your message. It'll save you a tremendous amount of time. Remember, my goal for this was to compress time for you so you didn't take the years it took me of trial and error learning. And also, it'll create less stress for you. You'll have processes you can put into place, even on short notice with your stories. If you would like to take a deeper dive, and by the way, if you're a sales professional, a speaker, a CEO, owner of a business, or an entrepreneur, this can help you. The next step for that is just to set up a Zoom call with me. This is Michael Pope. Michael is, I met him in Toastmasters in 2008, and he was so scared to speak the first time, he, he had dry mouth. He could barely get through his speech. And today he is a certified Maxwell trainer. And I really appreciate this note he sent me last year after he went through our six week online course. He said he learned more about storytelling in six weeks than he did in his previous 16 years. It's laser focused to help you. You may not wanna be a certified speaker or trainer, but it will shorten that learning curve. And that's what it helped Michael do. If you'd like to have a conversation with me, we'll set up a 20 minute call. Again, I'll put this in the chat box. You can use this QR code. Um, but as far as the information, that is what I have for you with two minutes to spare. Let me grab those two uh, links. Roger, I'm happy to close out with, uh, I got a final thought, but before we do that, if there's one or two last questions, I'm happy to share. Well, that. there's a hu hugely important question from Jason. 
are stories about one's personal struggles good to use in, I believe he means business presentations? Are stories about one's personal struggles good to use in business presentations? This is a terrific question, and they can be if they relate to your topic. So, for example, Jason, I told you the story of standing on my desk in first grade. That directly ties to what I do for a living. So, yes, absolutely. If it gives some background into a struggle you had as a kid, especially, um, or it doesn't have to be a kid, but it seems like the, 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 the earlier in life, the less and the deeper it is. If it can carry over to why you do what you do and how it helps you help other people overcome problems, absolutely. Personal, personal stories will always be the best, even in business, if they tie into what you do. Kim is asking, what's the URL for the checklist and the slides? That is the story bonuses that I just put in the chat box. Just click on that. Okay. Uh, and then if you want the 20-minute call, it's there too. Lovely. See You're very welcome, Kim. So why don't you make your concluding profound statement? Absolutely. Um, I'm 59 years old, and I've seen a lot of... Uh, changes in the world in 59 years, but I have never seen more conflict and butting of heads than I see right now. And you and I have a gift, and that is the opportunity to speak. Every time we have a chance to speak, we can make a difference in people's lives because of all the stress that are undergoing. And it, I don't care what your, your subject is, we can make a big difference. If you'll take some of these ideas and start to incorporate them into your stories, you're going to have an impact on people. And ultimately, that's what it's all about. Get out there and share your stories because the world needs them now more than ever. Despite our earlier problem tonight, I'm glad you all, we all came back. We got to do this. Thank you for the opportunity, Roger. I love what you're doing and keep up the great work with EIN. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, thank you hugely for that inspirational conclusion. Uh, you're so right. Uh, the power of story to cause people to take positive action uh, is just massive. And we as human beings have an obligation to make change happen, positive change happen. And boy, can, if we can harness the power of story in order to do that, uh, we together, acting in a spirit of goodwill, can really bring about positive change. Michael, thank you hugely thank you, for Roger. giving us the tool to make that happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for being here tonight.